Jerry Cohen, Don't Celebrate the Collapse of Soviet Communism. The addiction to the Soviet myth is as tenacious and difficult to cure as any other addiction. After the lost weekend in Utopia, the temptation is strong to have just one last drop, even if watered down and sold under a different label. Arthur Kostler. Gerald Allen, Jerry Cohen held the prestigious Chichelle Chair in Social and Political Theory at Oxford from 1985 to 2008. He was one of the founders of analytical Marxism. The goal of that movement, whose members also called it non-bullshit Marxism, was to use the tools of analytic philosophy, such as logic and rigorous conceptual analysis, to extract the salvageable core of Marxist doctrine from the various historical deposits of undisciplined speculation, obscurantism, and dubiously meaningful jargon. Some argue that this new approach has breathed new life into Marxist theorizing. Others disagree. For instance, one former analytical Marxist concluded that the non-bullshit Marxist movement exposed the flaws of Marxism so thoroughly that in the end nothing of value was left and non-bullshit Marxism was revealed to be an empty set. It is surprising that despite Cohen's undeniable philosophical sophistication and his declared interest in advancing human liberty, he always had a soft spot for the Soviet Union. This can partly be explained by his having been a red diaper baby growing up in an environment with strong communist sympathies. Nevertheless, one would have expected that his years-long scholarly research especially since it was devoted to political philosophy, should have done something to neutralize the effects of his hard-left indoctrination and that it should have led him later to join millions of others in celebrating the eventual demise of Soviet totalitarianism. But this did not happen. A fascist rebellion in Hungary in 1956. Here is how Cohen describes his own reactions to two key historical events. The Soviet action in Hungary in the autumn of October 1956 was regarded at the time by virtually everyone in the party as an entirely justified suppression of a fascist rebellion. I myself so regarded it at least as late as 1968. I recall contrasting it then with the invasion of Czechoslovakia that year, 1968, which thoroughly rid me of my pro-Sovietism. Notice an inconsistency in Cohen's report. He says that he regarded the 1956 Hungarian Revolution as a fascist rebellion, at least as late as 1968, whereby he obviously allows that he may have kept this view a bit longer, that is, after 1968. On the other hand, he claims he abandoned his pro-Sovietism thoroughly in 1968. Which is it? Also, he says he remembers that in 1968, he contrasted the Soviet action in Hungary with the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, which seems to imply that at the time in 1968, he actually had a very different opinion of these two events. Yet anyone who got pro-Sovietism thoroughly out of his system would have basically the same attitude to these two historical episodes. He would regard both the Hungarian Revolution and the Prague Spring as legitimate battles against communist oppression that were crushed by brute military force that Cohen did not terminate his loyalty to the Soviet Union in 1968 is also supported by what Michael Rosen, his former Oxford colleague and now Harvard professor of government, wrote after Cohen died. But even then, after the invasion of Czechoslovakia, I think he was too much of a loyalist to make the kind of noisy break with the party that the historian E.P. Thompson and many others had done. But there is a more pressing issue here. Although Cohen's sincerity in reporting his past pro-communist dogmatism may in some sense be admirable, the fact that he believed for years that what happened in Hungary in 1956 was a fascist rebellion is mind-boggling and defies easy explanation. How could such a thing be believed by someone who had studied at Oxford, who had taught philosophy for years at University College London, whose main research interest was politics? and who, after all, had even visited Hungary himself in 1962. And what exactly could he have taught students about politics, or more specifically communism, which obviously loomed large in his mind, if he could believe, at least until 1968, that the Russian tanks did a great favor to Hungary in 1956, saving it from fascism? Cohen also visited Czechoslovakia in 1964 and stayed there two weeks.
He went out often, talking to many people about politics, and he says their response was always the same. Going out and about the town, I found no one with a good word for the regime. And yet, even after witnessing the universal disillusionment with communism in Czechoslovakia, and in all likelihood having seen something very similar in Hungary in 1962, Cohen still somehow managed, for four years, to keep his belief that people protesting in the streets of Budapest in 1956 were fascists, and presumably that it is fortunate they were in the end defeated, and many of them killed, by the Red Army. In a prepared address Cohen was scheduled to deliver in Prague in 2001, he wrote about his long allegiance to Soviet communism. I know that what I had believed was paradise, or on the road to paradise, was for you and your forebears a form of hell. I don't think I can be blamed for not having realized that, for having thought the very opposite. My false belief was borne up by noble sentiments. But, rationally or otherwise, I nevertheless feel a need to apologize, and I hereby do. Translation. I will succumb to a possibly irrational need to apologize. In fact, I cannot be blamed for claiming that your hell was actually a paradise, nor for doing my part to support its continuation, for, you see, my sentiments were noble. There is no way these remarks would have been received well by people with a lot of recent unpleasant memories of communist oppression, so Cohen was in a way lucky that he could not make it to the Czech Republic due to visa problems. But in his prepared remarks, he went on, My Soviet allegiance came from an upbringing in which I was raised as a Marxist and Stalinist communist, the way other people are raised Roman Catholic or Muslim. My parents and most of my relatives were working-class communists, and several of them had served years in Canadian jails for their convictions. One of those who had been jailed was my uncle Norman. He was married to my father's sister Jenny, who I can tell you once danced with Joseph Stalin. What was the point here of mentioning that Cohen's Aunt Jenny danced with Stalin? Was the audience supposed to be impressed? Or was this just an interesting curiosity that the listeners were expected to find amusing? Let's try to see how this would work in an analogous situation. A person comes to Israel and offers an insincere and half-hearted apology for continually denying the plight of Jews in the Third Reich. Then at one point, he starts talking about his aunt, who, I can tell you, once danced with Adolf Hitler. The most likely reaction would be, Yimach Shemo. When Cohen says his uncle Norman was one of those who served years in Canadian jails for their convictions, this sounds as if he went to jail merely because he had the courage to express unpopular political views. In reality, Norman Freed was interned, rather than jailed, at the time of the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939, simply because the Canadian government feared that a number of militant and hardline Stalinists like him could follow instructions from Moscow and try to undermine preparations for the much-anticipated war against Hitler. In other words, Fried and others were detained not because of their communist convictions, but because it was believed they might subvert the upcoming battle against the evil of Nazism. I am not saying the internment of Fried and his fellow Stalinists was justified. I am only arguing that Cohen withheld an important piece of information and thereby led the reader seriously astray. In addition, there is strong evidence that Uncle Norman was actually an agent of the NKVD. This is what we can read in secret documents on Soviet espionage that Igor Guzenko, a clerk in the Soviet embassy in Ottawa, stole from the embassy and gave to the Canadian authorities when he defected to the West in 1945. The part of the report in which Norman Freed was mentioned by name as a Soviet agent was easily accessible public information already about 20 years before Cohen wrote the above text. It is hard to believe that he was unaware of it, especially given his strong interest in his family history and close emotional ties to his uncle and aunt. The reason Cohen decided to share information about some of his family members was this was supposed to help explain the origins of his own commitment to communism. One wonders, though, why he decided to disclose some things and not others. For example, if the purpose was to illustrate his Stalinist roots, was it not more important to mention that his uncle was probably an NKVD agent than the fact that his aunt once danced with Stalin?
Even up to his 60s, Cohen could not come to terms with his past, and toward the end of his life, his autobiographical remarks continued to be tendentious, disingenuous, and on occasion intentionally misleading. Cohen's penchant for idealizing the Soviet system sometimes reached ludicrous proportions. For instance, in the book that made him famous, Karl Marx's Theory of History, A Defense, 1978, 316, he says that in a conversation with Soviet academics, he once remarked, Whereas an American manager is motivated to conceal pollution caused by his plant, a Soviet manager can publicize it and request subventions to counteract it. A local sociologist schooled him. You are naive. If he, the Soviet manager, publicizes it, he will be replaced by someone who is more discreet. Needless to say, Cohen's assumption that a Soviet manager, basically a party apparatchik, would be so environmentally conscious that, amid notoriously dire economic straits, he would request and get subventions to counteract pollution was preposterous. This was clear to everyone at the time, except to those Western visitors to the Eastern Bloc whose wishful thinking and wide-eyed enthusiasm for all things Soviet made them lose contact with reality. The Price of Dreaming About Socialism At some point, it is unclear whether in 1968 or somewhat later, Cohen abandoned his long-held belief that the Soviet Union amply merited every leftist's allegiance, but he still retained a certain affection for the Soviet Union until its inglorious end. At the time of its collapse, Sam Bowles, one of Cohen's analytical Marxist friends, told him, we're partying. But Cohen did not want to join the celebration. I thought that was a very superficial response to the collapse of the Soviet Union, because with the disappearance of the great rival to capitalism, it begins to appear axiomatic that there is no alternative to capitalism. Sam had a point, but his celebration was premature. It was only once capitalism got into serious difficulties recently that the demise of the Soviet Union proved to be a boon, because now our thinking about alternatives to capitalism can be freer and more imaginative. It can't be stigmatizing as favoring the Soviet system, because the Soviet system is no longer there as a vivid example. This is an odd argument based on purely strategic reasoning. The point is simple. The socialist critics of capitalism do not need the Soviet Union when capitalism is in serious difficulties, but they do need its existence when capitalism is doing relatively well. Notice that in opposing the celebration of the breakdown of the Soviet Union, Cohen totally ignores one issue that almost everyone else would regard as being of paramount importance, the fate of all those millions of people who suffered so long under the yoke of communist tyranny. Cohen, however, resolutely rejects the idea that the liberation of the populations of many countries from a half-century of one-party dictatorship and terror of secret police is perhaps a decisive reason for celebration. The same omission is strikingly present in another article Cohen wrote in 1989 in which his pro-Soviet sentimentality comes to the fore again. It is true that I was heavily critical of the Soviet Union, but the angry little boy who pummels his father's chest will not be glad if the old man collapses. As long as the Soviet Union seemed safe, it felt safe for me to be anti-Soviet. Now that it begins, disobligingly to crumble, I feel impotently protective towards it. Those of us on the left, who were stern critics of the Soviet Union long before it collapsed, needed it to be there to receive our blows. The Soviet Union needed to be there as a defective model so that, with one eye on it, we could construct a better one. It created a non-capitalist mental space in which to think about socialism. Again, one may understand that Cohen wanted the Soviet Union to continue to exist so that he and other leftist intellectuals in the West could keep thinking about socialism while maintaining a foothold in the real world. But should he not have given at least some thought to the costs of this temporal extension that would be incurred by those who would have to live through these additional grim years of the really existing socialism? Indeed, could it be so enjoyable to go on dreaming about socialism in Oxford if one were aware that the price for this in East Berlin would be the prolongation of the notoriously miserable existence that was universally known and that was depicted later in the movie The Lives of Others. In his unbreakable attachment to the Soviet Union, 
Cohen resorted to a perverse logic similar to that of Jean-Paul Sartre half a century before. Should we call this bloody monster which lacerates itself socialism? I reply frankly, yes. It was even the only socialism in its primitive phase. There was no other, except perhaps in Plato's heaven, and it was necessary to will that, or not to will, any socialism at all. In choosing between socialism with all its horrors and any other alternative, neither Sartre nor Cohen could wish the bloody monster to go away. This is a curious instance of a continental and analytic philosopher finding common ground in the apology of totalitarianism. In his last book, published posthumously, Cohen tried to illustrate the advantages of socialism by proposing an analogy with a camping trip, pointing out that the non-existence of private property seems perfectly acceptable in that context. He then added humorously that there are limits to his outdoorsiness and that he'd rather have his socialism in the warmth of All Souls College, Oxford, than in the wet of the Catskills. But Cohen either failed to realize or was just not bothered by something important. Namely that, according to his own Faustian bargain, his having an opportunity to continue fantasizing about socialism in All Souls College would be possible only in exchange for many other people spending not a short camping trip in the wet of the Catskills, but many additional years in the cold of Siberia. It is curious how people like Jerry Cohen and Hilary Putnam, see Chapter 10, never seriously considered the possibility of leaving the capitalist world they detested so much and moving to a communist country which, despite all its imperfections, they saw as being on a road to utopia. The prospect of taking part in building the radiant socialist future themselves did not appeal to them at all. They preferred to cheer from a safe distance. Nevertheless, they argued that for the sake of the great cause, the Russians or Chinese should patiently endure every hardship in order to keep the flame of the revolution burning. W. H. Auden had something interesting to say about such an attitude in 1955. Our great error was not a false admiration for Russia, but a snobbish feeling that nothing which happened in a semi-barbarous country which had experienced neither the Renaissance nor the Enlightenment could be of any importance. Had any of the countries we knew personally, like France, Germany, or Italy, the language of which we could speak and where we had personal friends, been the one to have a successful communist revolution with the same phenomena of terror, purges, censorship, etc., we would have screamed our heads off. 